right, guys, welcome back. Uh, we're going to talk about a little topic here, uh, a little bit near and dear to my heart, as, a, as I was once one of them. Uh, that's right, I came from the dark side, ladies and gentlemen. I came from the evil world of dispatch. Oh, no, how terrible. But we're going to talk about some things that you might see on the National Registry Test having to do with EMS system communication. Uh, really important to understand some of these concepts as we go through. Um, but just understand that communication not only covers radio communication, texting, it, it also covers face-to-face, -face, how we talk to each other, the, the cycles uh, of usage, uh, especially like telemetry data. Uh, yes, we could actually transmit data that we have. As a matter of fact, that's one of the very cool things that's coming up on the horizon is that that we have um, we have some really good developments coming up via FirstNet where we're going to be able to do voice and data uh, together and uh, is going to definitely lead it. Uh, but there's a lag in development in the communication technology. Obviously, we've still got some systems that are essentially on CB radio, um, and, and it's kind of sad actually because we do have the we have the abilities to do it, but for some reason they haven't integrated that with the EMS. Um, that is whether it be cost prohibitive, uh, whatever the situation might be. So again, emergency medical dispatcher. That one I would know is the the is manages the entire the entire system of EMS response and readiness. Uh, these guys, uh, they they can not only take the calls, but they usually do the ambulance deployments, uh, moving up of ambulances. Uh, these are all part of that. Uh, again, remember, not only do you have to communicate with them, but you got to communicate with your family members, bystanders, others, and then other personnel, uh, allied agencies. And, uh, and again, good communication between everybody is, is so key and so crucial. If you read any um, disaster management uh, after action plan, I can almost guarantee you somewhere in there is going to be a breakdown of communication in which it should have been better. Uh, if you do any any after action analysis, you're going to see something like that. Uh, remember, we got to communicate well to the healthcare staff. Uh, you not only you know the, there's a lot of people above us, there's also some people that that work underneath those people at a nursing home. So again, and I, and I hate to use the word above and beneath because we alert alongside with them. So again, a medical direction physician, that's uh, the, they make the medical decisions and you interact with them all of the time. And matter of fact, it's one of the things that I highly encourage is that you get to know your doctors in your area because it is a team endeavor. And if you call the doc and you need something, you need some help, they're, they're going to work with you, especially if they know who you are and they trust you. Um, so, um, you know, again, we communicate via uh, individuals. We, we not only have verbal messages, but we have, you know, those nonverbal clues as well. But when we're talking about the verbal communication. We're talking about encoding and decoding a message. Um, and, and what that is is that we select the medium in which we send it, and then the receiver has to decode it. Um, I talk. I make voice sounds. comes out of my mouth. It goes to your ears. But what happens if I'm speaking Russian? or I'm speaking Chinese, are you going to be able to understand me? And that answer is probably no, because although I have sent the message, I didn't send it in a mess in a way in which you could decode it and then, and then understand and interpret it. Um, so again, um, you've got to have all these different components. Again, this is kind of a typical dispatch system, uh, in the, in the way that it works. But again, they're using, you know, verbal, um, verbal sound. You know, again, they're using the radio system where it turns it into a signal, transmits it to you, your receiver picks it up, and then turns it into into, into sound in which you can hear. Uh, so semantics, by the way, the meaning of words. Uh, technical is going to be the communication hardware that they talk about. And then, uh, again, communication is with a mutual language. Uh, and then the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, uh, the, they, they have initiated, one of the things that was a big push is, is that we use in an emergency situation, we're using plain English to communicate. Now, the reason I say this, what happens if we're going into an area where um, they're using different codes or uh, or different TIN codes and and you know, or signal codes? And the problem with that is, is we could have two different sets of signals. I, I know a signal 40 
here in Marion County was a crazy person. Signal 40 in, um, or excuse me, Signal 20 was, but a Signal 20 in Putnam County was a plane crash. And so you, you can get some different uh, interpretations of that. Um, and what just, and, and that's why we went to the, the standardized English within an emergency setting. And so it's not that it's standardized English, it's just that we talk in plain text because we don't want to try to to intervene and, and, and have different meanings come from it if we're speaking just plain regular English. It's not to mean that we still don't use certain phrases, uh, and, and you'll see that a lot, especially if you take an I-100 and I-200 course. We use the same terminology or try to use the same terminology when we do that. Um, again, uh, relay all the medical information, and the amount of information depends on the type of technology you're using, the priority of the patient or local communication protocol. So they can actually set up a form. This is how we want you to, to describe it. Uh, how we want you to give your radio reports. Uh, but when you do give it, uh, uh, you communicate, it needs to be efficient. And again, because that way it helps whoever's receiving it to assimilate the information about the patient quickly. Um, and if you ever go into an ER and you listen to a report and you get somebody droning on, usually the nurse walks away. So all this important information that you're quote-unquote telling them uh, basically is going to nobody in a nowhere state. So again, just the facts, keep it concise, keep it short. What is it that they need to know over the radio? If you're calling for orders, it might be a smarter thing to do is to call the physician on the telephone and, and get orders that way. Um, again, if you do it over the radio, I would very specifically say, hey, I need to get orders from the doctor so that they know to get the doctor by the radio when we're actually listening to it. Um, again, we use a standard format. Again, usually these are, are agency driven. Uh, but when we're given a radio report, usually we want to give them basically the acuity of the patient, um, the age, sex, uh, again, the chief complaint, the basic stuff about what's going on. Uh, they're, they're, they're truly stable or unstable. Paint that picture. And then uh, a treatment that you might have done and how long it's going to be before you get there. Uh, I would say some of this other stuff is actually not going to be heard by the by the them. And so, again, keep your radio report short and precise. If you're using a actual radio where you're using a radio transmitter, let's say it's not a phone. Remember that a phone is basically just a, it's got a sending and a receiving, and you can do it at the same time. But most of our transmitters are do not have that. They You transmit, um, you're able to transmit, and then you're able to receive. So when you do do it, Make sure that you uh, you listen to the channel before transmitting. You don't want to walk over somebody. Press the transmit button. Not, usually, most places will tell you to wait about one second before starting to speak. Especially if you're using a digital or an 800 or a 900 radio system. that The system actually has to um, send identifiers in order for it to key up and in order to activate. And you want to have those activators because it's not you're actually not going to be heard until after those activators have been sent by whatever transmitting medium that you're using. When you're using the radio, um, you don't need to be up here like this. Uh, a little bit back is just fine. They, the microphones can pick up just fine. Uh, again, use the codes unless it's part of your system. Uh, don't waste air time. Again, remember, if you've got a message, there's probably other people that have messages as well. Again, keep it short, keep it sweet. And again, by the way, nothing about patient information should ever go over a radio um the only and even like when we call the va sometimes we're going to get this uh uh they want the patients at the three initials and then the last four their social uh that that is definitely borderlining on on a, a, a violation of hipaa so again you want to protect the patient's privacy okay and then you're using your proper unit or hospital numbers, the correct names or titles. Make sure that you're using that. If I call up Monroe and I'm asking for Monroe, which hasn't been Monroe in a little bit of a while, again, Advent is the, the, the correct terminology for the hospital. Uh, if you are using the radio, uh, no slang, no profan definitely no profanity. Uh, absolutely not. Uh, the FCC does regulate that and can shut down your transmitters for doing that. Uh, an echo procedure, what an echo procedure is, is that um, the doctor tells me to do something, I'm going to say it back to him to make sure that I've got it correct. Okay, 
Uh, again, make sure that you get your write down your address, dispatch communications, physician orders. Make sure you do that and obtain confirmation that the, that you have received it and that you have understood what they want to do. Again, our PCR, we've done the whole thing on documentation already. Uh, documentation, we, again, it is part of the legal record and it's part of the patient's permanent medical record. It also contains uh, call information. So you need to get these filled out as quickly as possible. Objective, legibly written, uh, using proper terminology. It illustrates your professionalism. And by the way, all that information is sent to Washington, D.C. via um, uh, the NEMSA system. Actually, in, in here in Florida, it's sent to Florida. Uh, M-STARS, M-STARS then sends it to NEMSAs. Um, but the point of that is, is that when they're making decisions, they're making a decision based upon NEMSA's data. Okay, so making sure that you do your part to get that data correct. Uh, and I can tell you right now, it has paid huge dividends for Florida because of the fact that we, we kind of pioneered a lot of the, matter of fact, there are a lot of their states are using our model to send that up to the, to the NEMSA system. So it, it's actually working very well. And, and again, we, we have definitely benefited from that. So again, these are some of your tom, uh, common terminologies, if you will, uh, you, you understand uh, landing zones, ETA. Uh, just uh, be familiar with those. Um, and again, we usually use plain English when we're talking with the radios at this point. Uh, again, make sure uh, when you're doing a response, make sure that, that you use all of these principles with your skills, empathy, confidence, self-control. Remember that these things are going to be portrayed. It shows your professionalism. It shows your 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 character, if you will, okay? So in your clinical experience, there are skills that you use in any type of particular situation. Um, so usually the communications uh, sequence in an EMS response is uh, the, somebody finds out that there's a problem, they call 911, and, uh, or they can be, this can be done, by the way, via automatic crash notification, or, uh, and then it usually goes to the public safety answering point. Usually they have at least one per county. Uh, certain municipalities have, again, additional ones. But it's one centralized place where they can then distribute the calls where they need to go. And then E911, it works on the, the landline systems, by the way. Uh, but here's here's the thing. in Even in the last 15 years, um, cell phone use has gone through the roof, okay? Matter of fact, a lot of places now don't have um, wired phones. And the problem is with that is, is that they're having to use a, a system called Phase 2, in which to locate where the patient's coming from. Now, they do they have the identifiers with it. But remember that somebody coming in on a wireless call, we can get a lot of longitude and latitude on them of where they at, and we can kind of translate that to where they are at. But it doesn't actually give us the true address when it pops up on a 911 screen. Okay? And, and actually, the 911 screen is very cool. If you call from a landline, guys, there is a, there is a, it gives us a location in the database. Now, dispatchers still have to verify that to make sure that, it's, that we're going to be going to the right place. Um, so, again, uh, the EMS response, uh, voice over IP, internet protocol, this is all that additional communication that, that's headed down the route. And next generation 911, which is NG911, which is your first net system, uh, which is going to be a extremely powerful because we're going to be able to do basically video conferencing over in our trucks uh, along with all the data it's going to be sent back and forth, an extremely fast system. Uh, and they've actually done some really proactive things. But again, it's very complicated. And because of that, deployment has been delayed a couple of times. And again, COVID has not helped that situation as well. So your EMD is going to be your first public contact, emergency medical dispatcher. They usually use a card system to determine the, the priority of the response. Um, and most of them are computerized, but there's a, a card backup to it. Now, as soon as they ask the questions, they find out where they're going to go, uh, what their what their callback number is, exactly what the problem is, and then they have a series of questions based upon the complaint that they're given. Uh, they can do this, by the way, for fire law and EMS. Okay, so it's not. It started out actually in EMS. Uh, uh, Jeff Clausen Kloss, uh, is the actual one that started it for the NAEMD. Uh, and then, of course, there's different other systems. There's APCO out there. There's other systems in which they can use. 
Uh, but the, the basis of those, though, is that when they get done, they have post-dispatch instructions. Or in certain cases, they, the, the dispatcher can actually give them instructions while the ambulance is responding. They call it a zero-minute response time. And these are, again, are very good things, uh, again. But they also, the EMD will help coordinate your responses. And, and sometimes there's calls that are a little bit more complex in which call coordination absolutely has to happen. Um, and again, they can, uh, usually once we get there, we assess the patient. We're either going to follow our standing orders and protocols. <coughs> Excuse me. We can actually get orders for intervention. Uh, and usually we make sure that we tape these or record them. Uh, and it's very, very much needed to be done because, again, when something goes wrong and it's not recorded. And so I highly recommend that any time you do a where you're getting a formalized order, uh, most of your radio channels in all of these counties are recorded, by the way. So they have a, a tape system in which they record them. So if you're getting an order on the radio, again, you're usually pretty much covered. If you're going to be calling in on a phone, I highly recommend that you do it via telephone and do that through a dispatch center where they can record what is being said. I can't stress that one enough. Okay, uh, make sure once you get there, again, you're going to transfer care. Uh, you remember, you have to give it to uh, uh, no less than the the level of care that you are. And then you hand off the patient. Uh, the patient's vital information, chief complaint, uh, all those lovely things. Save your extensive report, guys, for when you get to the hospital. Don't give a big report over the radio. Give it once you get there to the hospital. Uh, I will tell you that if you go to Shands, make sure both the nurse and the doctors are in the room at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to give the report three times. So make sure that you do that. Uh, and usually if you just say, hey, is this everybody? So I can give it, you know, just the one time. Um... So again, never leave your patient unless you've completed the formal transfer of care. If you do so, that is considered abandonment. Um, and boy, there's there's some jury out on that one. Um, if you have given report, uh, then you are pretty much covered, and they acknowledge that they've received it. And then you again finish your your documentation for the for the patient, and then you tra again and you make sure that those are submitted so that they can get back and they can go with the patient. Most of the time, if you use an electronic chart, usually you're going to use a small paper, like a quick sheet, and that's what you're going to give to the nurse at that time. To do that will suffice until your formal report can be put in. All right. So again, your situational awareness. Uh, again, and, and common operating picture is important considerations. So it helps us prepare. So anything that we can get from information uh, is so very important. Uh, GI, GIS. Uh, a lot of people hate them. Um, I will tell you that I am a huge proponent of that, especially in the EMS environment, because if you are lost or you're going the wrong direction, the dispatcher can actually look down and go, hey, you're going the wrong direction or something's not right. Or if they're getting into trouble, we can get people there. OK, so it helps us link all those folks together. Again, uh, data system technology is the hardware and software development uh, professionals. And, and hopefully you've got a system where all of these things integrate. In other words, you get a dispatch. When you walk out to your truck, the call information is there. A map is drawn to the call. It shows you where to go, when to go. It's got all your times in there. You can actually enter your chart while you're on the way to the hospital. These things are so very important about having these technologies. Okay. Um, again, we're working to get these communication systems better. Actually, if you stop and think about this, and we're going to talk about the different parts of a a radio system here. Um, cell phone towers are actually nothing more than gigantic repeaters that, that interlink with each other. Okay. But we use basically an EMS or, or, or any emergency response system, uh, this type of system, a, a repeater system. Usually you have your base station, uh, this guy right here. And uh, again, the repeaters in which they, they these are multiply transmitted on channels. So long and short is, is if I pick up a radio, even if it's a portable radio, and I'm able to hit the repeater, the thought process is, is that you can hear the same thing here, you see it the same thing here, and you're going to hear the same thing in here. Uh, reality, based upon the types of repeaters that you have or the portables that you have, that's not necessarily the case, okay? Um, usually these are very low wattage for transmission, and it's very hard to hear off of them. 
Now, the better the system, obviously, uh, the uh, the 800, 900 megahertz systems, uh, basically, I've been in one part of the county and talking to another person at the other end of the county, and it sounded like the person was standing next to me. I've also been to some places where uh, literally you can't get a transmit out to actually hit a repeater until without going out to your truck. And even then, the volume is bad, to, to say the least. So again, uh, the two frequencies is uh, uh, UHF, and by the way, 800, 900 megahertz, those are UHF frequencies, actually. And then your very high frequencies, these are your usually the, the older style radios. Uh, but now the good news is, is most all of EMS communication now is no longer on an analog. Most of them have been transitioned to a digital system. So it actually turns it into digital uh, uh, bytes of data. It transmits that, and then it turns back into sound. But again, encoding and decoding it back there. Um, so again, it... And by the way, one other thing about the, the repeater systems, um, not so much in Florida that we have to worry about it, but if you notice, if you go up, especially into a mountainous region, you're going to notice a lot of towers on top of the hills. Remember that all of these waves here, guys, are line of sight. Uh, if you don't have line of sight, it's not going to hit these things, okay? That's the long and the short. So you've got to have line of sight. You have to have clear view. That's why when you get around trees or in between buildings, that's where that becomes a problem. That's why you can't hear Okay, um, and by the way, speaking of the UHF and VHF frequencies, uh, the VHF usually goes into places deeper. Uh, ultra high frequencies, uh, it's got a sh it penetrates more. The variable high frequency goes for a longer distance. Um, so again, UHF works really great, but it's got it requires a lot of repeaters. It requires a lot of behind the scenes work where your variable high frequency does not require that, and again, it transmits farther. Your simplex communication, uh, it transmits and receives on one frequency, but you can't do both at the same time. Uh, most places that I know of actually have duplex. Again, one transmits, one receives. The problem is, is that usually your radio isn't able to do both at the same time. Okay. Now, but the good news about a duplex is that it really does work like telephone communication, and it can transmit either voice or data with that. Uh, your multiplex systems, again, these guys have the ability to do voice and data simultaneously. So I would be able to send my rhythm strip along with showing the doctor, along with completing the report, along with talking to somebody else on the phone while we were doing all that. So multiplex systems, again, usually cost a little bit more money. Uh, your truncated systems, it pools all the frequencies, and then it assigns frequencies as needed. Uh, it requires a computerized system. Uh, in order which to do that, okay? And it usually goes on a first-come, first-needed basis. Again, most of our services now, we have that, that digital radio. So that's the good news, is people can't hear actually what we're saying over these things unless they have the true decoder and and, and the, the breakdown of that decoder frequency. Uh, the old analog systems, again, you pretty much, if you knew the frequency, uh, you could hear and listen in on the communications. Uh, most nowadays, that they, they usually doesn't happen. Well, the problem is, is they usually use a repeated signal, and the repeated signal is not in the digital code, so therefore everybody gets to hear it. Um, and again, so just, it is easy, very easy to over overdo the frequencies, even with digital communication. Okay, so again, make sure that your channel's clear before you go to start talking and, and transmitting on those. Okay. Again, our, our cell tel cellular telephones, again, there are many services I know that do that they do everything on cellular telephone, okay? Great, until the cell, t the cell towers go out, okay? And again, that's why they put a real, like, especially like a hurricane, uh, that's why they put a lot of emphasis on to reconnecting the cell towers so that we can get communication up and running again. Um, so again, by the way, modern phones, uh, again, your iPhone today has more technology on it than the thing that went back to the moon in 19 in the 1960s so again there's a lot of things that we're able to do with that um and a matter of fact when the the new 5g and the new first nets come online guys it's going to be a lot lot faster in order to do these things we're going to be able to actually probably do ultrasounding and do the ultrasound where the doctor can read it right there in real time okay uh Big clue here, no paramedic or EMS agency should rely solely on commercial wireless communication. 
Uh, and I'm a big proponent of that. Here's the problem. The, if you decide to go just with a commercial carrier and they decide to shut everything off, well, you're stuck and you've got no communication. Okay. So I would highly recommend that you not do that. And it's why systems should have their own radio and radio systems. Okay. Um, let's see here. We've already talked about all that good Lily stuff. And by the way, the medical quality and imaging and video, uh, this is probably going to be out a lot faster than a lot of people think. But right now, uh, and a matter of fact, I've actually done it on a few calls where I show the doc the strip. I'll, I'll FaceTime the doc and go, hey, doc, hey, look at this. And they'll be like, uh-oh. And so it, and, and it really is a, a cool thing to do, especially when you've got something that you're not familiar with. Again, usually the doctor is familiar with it. And they'll start they'll start helping out and you can do that so don't don't be afraid by the way to do that especially if you have the doc let's say on the facetime ability uh it it, it definitely helps and, it, and it, if it speeds care along by all means let's do it uh community paramedicine oh boy okay i'm gonna get in trouble on this one <laughs> um preventative health services is what it does it allows for follow-ups um, and I hate to say this term, but it, it's more or less, it's trying to prevent the calls before they happen. And, and I, I don't disagree with that, that ideal. Um, and, but the problem is, is that, um, uh, this is an area of home health nursing where, where this is in what they're trying to do is supplement that with a paramedic type service. Uh, I think that there is a place for it. Here's the problem. Nobody wants to fund it. Nobody wants to pick up the tab for it. Nobody wants to put the cost for it. Um, the other thoughts have been about this is to allow the on-duty crews in which to go do health checks. I think that our systems are way overloaded now. The last thing we need to do is add going and checking on the frequent flyers three and four times a day. Um, again, new technologies are coming out all the time, guys. Uh, we're, we're able to... Uh, when I was in dispatch, one of the biggest things was is detecting if there was a, a device. It was just after uh, 9-11. And we were able to detect uh, bombings or, 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 or chemical attacks or, new, or biological attacks. And these are all things, but we, we were using new technology that was by now considered antiquated technology. But we are, we are definitely, we were, back then it was extremely cutting edge. And, and it was very important. And we fostered that, and things have gotten better. Uh, compared to 20 years ago, the communication systems now are, are in a, they are light years ahead of what we had. And, and by the way, I think that we still have some, some room to get better. I, I definitely 100% believe in that. I believe that we should be able to be FaceTiming a patient while we're on the way to the call. Uh, I think the dispatcher should be able to plug us in where we can start everything before we even get there. So essentially, once we get there, then we're connecting to a doc and going, hey, doc, what do you want us to do for this person? So all of these things are, are able to do that. Uh, the advanced automated crash notification guys, uh, these are, uh, they have sensors in the cars. Awesome technology. Matter of fact, you can call a trauma alert with a 97% predictability rate based upon the data that you obtain crash notification system it's actually extremely uh kind of scary but it, it, very well proven technology and if you want to know why you're paying a little bit more for your car that's why right there okay matter of fact it, it is extremely reliable as far as the the mechanism of injuries okay um with that being said uh again the, the projects that that we're trying to do that again there's both local regional statewide national public safety these are the things that the guys from communications do and i think every service has got that one or two people in which does all the communications work for their system and i think that actually there should be more of them because the talking to everybody is so very important when we do this um and yes there are state plans in place uh that allow us to communicate with the different places uh, one of the very, we brought the Super Bowl to Jacksonville years ago. One of the biggest things was is making the, where all the counties could talk to each other uh, on 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 if we could tie the bands together, and it's something that we were able to implement. 
it's not a hundred percent. It's not the greatest thing in the world. But now, you know, eight counties can talk on one frequency and and be able to communicate with each other. So it's an extremely good thing in which to do. Again, the FCC, these guys are the all-knowing, all-seeing gods of the universe when it comes to communication. And the matter of fact, the amount of power that these guys have is truly scary. They can pretty much turn on or shut down any communication within, within the borders of the United States and probably a little bit beyond that. Okay, uh, But they are the ones that are determine who gets frequencies, how many portables you can have. How many, uh, how many uh, handhelds you can have? How many base stations you can have? These guys are the ones that decide all of that, okay? And again, they can come in and shut down there. So they do licensing and allocation for the frequencies. Uh, they establish the technical standards, and they do all the licensing. And by the way, if you have an unlicensed radio, they can come in, and they have a lot of ways that they can stop you from doing that. It is truly kind of scary of the things that you can and can't do. So again, they also monitor language for appropriate language, appropriate use. If you're using the fire department to uh, to have a party, they're going to definitely shut you down. It's it's supposed to be well, what they're doing. They do stop set base check stations and dispatch centers, and they check for the appropriate licenses and the records. So as you see, communication is not just you know a radio or a telephone. There's a lot to it. Okay. And you need to make sure that you understand the different parts and how to better communicate with the people you work with, the patients that you're dealing with, okay? So very important to do that, both your verbal and your nonverbal communication. Uh, one of the famous things we always did with dispatch. Copy. Here we go. No. Okay. You know, speak speak clearly. Speak with the intent and purpose to speak with professionalism. It's amazing how far that goes. Be concise. Be professional. Be complete, and then conform to the national standards as well as local protocols, and that you usually have a seamless problem. All right, that's it for communication. I know it's, again, a pretty long one, but it's a, a one-and-done one for us. So, uh, guys, I'll see you on the next one.